I usually start the workshop with a, a little housekeeping. I let you know that shortly I'll be asking you to close your eyes and listen to your breath so you know it's coming. And then I talk a little bit about uh, uh, whatever's been on my mind in the hope of setting technical focus for the session. Whatever's been on my mind about writing, not just any old thought that I had. Uh, and then I ask you to listen to your breath and I, I ease you into this relaxed state of flow and focus. And then I give you a writing drill or a prompt. And today is a little different. So just brace yourself. I began sorting through an idea in the Tuesday evening humor workshop. I, I see that your hand is up. Um, okay, just uh, what's going on? Uh, so I, I was working through this idea uh, in the, the Tuesday humor workshop. I sort of improvised through a rough draft. And then I did the same thing uh, in, in, the, in the Wednesday evening, the, the Wednesday evening open writing session. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, spotlight myself in a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna present a thing. Uh, Mike Kaplan sent me an email uh, containing a quotation that I want to read to you to start this evening's session. But I, it's going to take me some time to get there. Mike is a brilliant post grunge performer with an optimistic approach to a hyper verbal comedic dialectic or as he would probably prefer to be called a funny comic. Uh, he's a writer, he's a performer, he has all the things that make for a great comedian, a personal and personable style and a very fast and facile wit and a genuinely kind, inclusive, humanitarian spirit that lives in every performance he gives, every joke he writes, every email he sends, and seemingly every thought he has. In, f in fact, his voice is in my head suggesting that while I offer these ideas, you are welcome to close your eyes and listen to your breath if you like. Uh, you are capable of listening to your breath and hearing my words at the same time. I have no doubt that this is a multitask of which you are capable. You may choose if you enjoy that to focus entirely on the sound and remember that it has been with you from the moment of your birth and it will be with you until the time of your death and as long as you can find that sound regardless of all else that is going on, everything is pretty much okay. Mike and I sat on a stoop in Mill Valley a few years ago, and we talked about his philosophies about human decency and my philosophies about the idea that there is a magical quality to jokes, each one the right word spoken in the right order with the right inflection and pacing produces an outward rippling effect on others. It can cause a whole room full of people to think a thought at the same time. Mike yesterday sent me an email that referenced that conversation from a few years ago and presented to me this quotation from Alan Moore, the writer of V for Vendetta and I think The Watchmen and none of that matters. But he sent me this thing and I wanted to start today's session with it but it requires some complex context for you to understand its impact on me. So in essence, this has been a deconstructionist introduction to a reconstructivist introduction to a couple of paragraphs sent to me by Mike Kaplan with whose work also I suggest you acquaint yourself. And again, I will not be offended if you choose to focus on the sound of your breath. It occurs to me, now that I have Mike making such suggestions in my head, that perhaps there are ways in which hearing a reading while we focus on the breath makes it more like reading or like watching or like dreaming. It's all up to you, whatever you choose to do. Or you can watch the thing and enjoy what I'm saying and not listen to your breath at all. I, I cannot make these decisions for you. You are a grown up. We are not the boss of you. Here we go. Diagramming a joke, lecture 104. You can come into this intermittent lecture series, I suppose, at any time, and I assign the numbers for 
each of these occasional diatribes randomly for everyone's inconvenience. In keeping, I realize, with the tradition started by my father. My father once looked at a drawing I had done and said, oh, this is interesting. I think it's time for you to hear lecture number 752 on framed composition as interpreted through the eyes of the artist. And I was eight years old. That drawing did not make the refrigerator display. And that was the day that I learned who Susan Sontag was. Now I began writing jokes or uh, more accurately, trying to get laughs when I was a child. My father scored most of my jokes on a scale of one to 10, although the only scores he ever gave were plus 12 or minus two. Plus 12 was anything that made him laugh aloud. Minus two was anything that broke the rhythm of conversation or, 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 or took too long for him to understand. Uh, and then other jokes so mediocre as to deserve neither the plus 12 reward or the minus two dismissal and negative ranking were simply acknowledged and rejected. Uh, uh, if I did a joke that I had stolen from television, he would say, that's not yours. Or if, I, if I did some easy sound alike pun uh, is equivalent of a, a comics nod or the banter is nice, you know, he would just sort of go, <laughs> Like that at me. That was, that was for puns. And then there were hard ones that I had to squint and talk slowly through to build toward a punchline. Those required, in his words, a lot of machinery. Darren, you have to remind me to review lecture 237 on the machinery of a joke about three weeks after you remind me to create lecture 237 on the machinery of a joke. And that it has to include that clicky sound. Put that, put, make a note that it has to, I have to figure out how to spell because that's part of it. It has to be a lot of machinery there, Dill. I was not fully aware at that time of the way in which a referenced spectrum in which only the outliers are worth scoring holds in it a level of impossible perfectionism. Anything else that is not either a, a plus 12 or a minus two is dismissible out of hands for reasons unworthy of further examination or exploration, right? That's, mediocrity is not even to be discussed. I digress. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a little distracting because as I speak of this experience with my father, um, I realize that there is language that I'm using that holds its own magic in it, and I can't explore that avenue in the middle of this bigger thought. The first scored breach of the plus 12 minus two structure came when I was in first grade. I lived in a small, all white, all Christian, all working class town. And I heard from a classmate, a classmate, a classmate, a tiny little friend of mine in school. I learned, I heard from a classmate, one of the thousands of jokes that ends with the phrase, a good start. And I brought this joke home to make my father laugh. And he said, that is the kind of joke that starts at minus 42 and goes down from there. He said, I think it's time for you to hear lecture number 931 on the difference between ethnic humor and an ethnic joke. It was the day that I learned the word stereotype and the, 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 the phrase human decency and the word empathy and the word anti-Semitic and the compound word self-loathing all in this one lecture. And it was the day that I learned that a good joke reveals the truth about humanity. Ethnic humor allows a particular group to make light of shared cultural experience, while ethnic jokes are designed to reinforce stereotypes that are based not in truth, but in the belittling of the culture, appearance, or intelligence of an ostracized group.
my father used Polish jokes as his example of this. The joke, no matter how it was structured, revolved around the lie that people of Polish descent are inherently stupid. Obviously, this is not true, but every time a joke reinforces it, the comfort the teller and the audience feel ostracizing Poles becomes more ingrained and the belief in the stereotype more widespread. Even those who say just kidding, at some level, believe that that group is lesser than they, lesser to they, lesser of them, is of groups, the ostracized is the lesser. Now, there's been a lot of, I've been doing a lot of vamping because a thing has occurred to me that is not in my notes, but that I want to include. As a child, I read a book called The Wise Man of Helm. It was a bunch of folk stories, uh, genuine ethnic humor about a fictional shtetl full of the not so bright whose misadventures illuminated the dangers of rigid thought, of literalism, of non-critical thinking. And there were these hilarious little folk tales about stupid people, about those who overestimate their own intellect, about a rabbi and a beetle and a um, uh, uh, a cantor and the, the local store owner. I don't remember quite how the, char the characters were structured, but they were all very pompous and very self-certain and always taking shortcuts in their thinking and getting something wrong. And they were ultimately uh, a humorous introduction to Talmudic re reasoning. And as I was just a minute ago talking about the Polak jokes that my dad talked about, I realized the wise men of Helm might have been the origin of that, then bastardized. So that the, the wise men of Helm were filtered through the eyes of Gentiles and weaponized to make these people look stupid, removing the all the wit and, and the underlying power of the, 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 the tales the complex ideas about reasoning and philosophy um, that were taught originally through the foibles of a hapless humani uh, humanity, the, the hapless inhabitants of a town from which nobody truly came. So the, the recognizable, a good start punchline makes the hair stand up on the backs of our necks when it is uttered in uh, the film Get Out by the brilliant Jordan Peele. There he has it spoken of a deer killed in the road. And he says it to a young black man. And it's a middle-aged white guy who says it. It's, it's um, Bradley Whitford, the pioneer of the mid-sentence repressed belch acting technique. Now, I believe in a complex system of happenstance that has grown up around what my father would call Jungian synchronicity and Jung would call synchronicity. And Jung's hypothesis that like attracts like in time and space explained why the person who hasn't met anyone named George in nine years will suddenly meet five Georges in a week and then get a call from the one they met nine years ago. Right? The only previous explanation for that kind of coincidental bunching of connected experiences came from the Druids, who called them follow signs. A follow sign uh, or set of follow signs was an indication that the observer is on a path, uh, not a good path or a bad path, you're on a path. Uh, and I like Druids. Druids understood that language itself is magic, that written language and spoken language, that sign language are all powerful forms of magic. They, they knew that uh, rhymed words and words set to music can aid in memory and teaching and learning. Uh, uh, Druids, in fact, had a kind of spell called a satire that's spelled with a Y uh, that was a few lines generally rhymed, often hilarious, that one spoke publicly to curse an unjust tribal leader or, uh, uh, or despot or, you know, uh, king, whatever. 
if, if, if they spoke these, this spell customized for a circumstance before the people who were oppressed, the oppressor could no longer properly wield authority. I, I think it's the, uh, the origin of the modern limerick. And, it's, and that's the kind of connection that I was making when I realized the thing about the wise men of hell. Druids understood the magical power of a good joke, the right words spoken in the right order and uh, with the right inflection and rhythm can cause an entire room full of people to think in a new way simultaneously to share the experience of laughter and forever alter the way they view a thing or a person. These curses could be laid upon the powerful. Um, and it was this power that David Steinberg intuited he was using when he said uh, before or as Nixon was being elected, before Nixon was, perhaps before even Nixon was not elected the first time, um, he said to audiences, uh, I am going to tell you something and then you will never be able to think about Richard Nixon the same way again. His face looks like a foot. That joke, his face looks like a foot, could have stood alone. But he knew that he was doing something important with it and wasn't afraid to call it out as a way of deepening the spell. Now, Nixon, who uh, may have been thin-skinned in general, did not always lash out at anyone who said anything about him in public. But there was a visit from Secret Service to David Steinberg's dressing room at one time suggesting that he not do any Nixon related face foot material. Because at some level, when Nixon heard that joke, or perhaps those sworn to protect him heard that joke, they recognized the power in it. They just didn't know it was magic that brought the power to bear. Now, as more people became aware of ethnic jokes uh, and the, their damaging nature, to, if nothing else, to their own reputations, uh, but as people became aware of the damaging nature of uh, ethnic jokes, we began to wrestle with our own consciences uh, in modern America. And a lot of old Jew jokes, not Jewish jokes that came from an encyclopedia of Jewish humor, but those that were about how money hungry Jews were, how we were conniving or how jealously we guard our money or our space lasers or whatever. Um, the, those got to be reworked uh, as lawyer jokes or in Hollywood as producer jokes. And a lot of Polak jokes got repurposed into blonde jokes because the, the, the joke depends on us all knowing that that group of people is stupid or that group of people is greedy. They were still bad jokes and they continued to be demeaning of a huge swaths of people based on a profession or a physical attribute. And still at that time, Homosexuals remained a comfortable target for mainstream America. In the late 80s, early 90s, when a lot of comics were doing openly gay bashing material on stage, I had a piece in my act about my belief that homophobia was still an accepted form of bigotry. Uh, and, and a really early bit on the topic took the stance that I didn't understand homophobia. Um, I. I don't understand what there is to fear. It's not like there are packs of gay men roaming the countryside, blowing straight men against their will. We know this because no man has ever been blown against his will. And we know that because blowjobs are like birthday cake. You, you don't get one that often. When you do, you don't care if it's not exactly the kind you were hoping for. 
look, I'm, I'm a happy cisgendered married man. If someone makes an offer after a show and he's got a fairly clean shave, I'm going to have to think about it before I offer a straight up or down answer. Um, this, it was a very strong, before I go further, it was not cisgendered married male when I was doing it. It was uh, a happy heterosexual man who dates, I don't remember what it was, but it, uh, it doesn't matter. But I didn't want, someone would email me going, you didn't do that bit in the 80s. Nobody said cisgender in the 80s, because that's how Twitter works and how... Um, YouTube works and so on. Uh, I did not, I, I rewrote it as I was, there were, it was a strong enough run. Let <laughs> me get out of that hole. It was a strong enough run that when I was headlining, it got laughs, sometimes applause breaks. Even when I followed an act who had just gotten huge laughs from a week run making light of the AIDS crisis or, 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 building jokes around flouncing, lisping caricatures. When I featured for a headliner like that, who did that stuff, and I was the feature, mind you, then they couldn't understand why suddenly their surefire bit about how protective they were of their poop shoots wasn't getting the big laughs they expected. To introduce the more challenging premise to a crowd, I had to build stronger jokes to support it, make real observations of my own and structure them into punchlines. I couldn't get away with building on shared assumptions and the tribal laughter that comes from pointing and laughing at the group in the minority, right? Now, when I hear anyone, especially a comedian, defend a joke saying it's only a joke, they say something, and yes, it's structured as a joke. Uh, and then someone says, hey, that's not, it's only a joke. I, it infuriates me. I see sometimes more silently than others, because to devalue one's use of a powerful magic, to set aside responsibility by claiming that what is said in a joke need not be considered, seems an offensive abrogation of basic human duty. My mother's comment almost every time she saw me perform comedy in the 80s and well into the 90s was that she thought I should be more like Jack Benny. It would not be until years later that I would begin to understand the underpinnings of her love for Jack Benny. This was a Jewish comedian on radio and then on television who made stinginess a character attribute. He was in fact, tremendously generous by all accounts. He took on in doing this as a character, all the jokes that had been heaped upon a people and by shoulder, shouldering the stereotype himself, he made the jokes not about Jews, but about a character flaw that an individual might have. By taking the characteristic unwillingly in performance while exhibiting it not at all as a man, he was able more truthfully to aim the jokes at the unflattering and resented quality shared by a lot of humans, greed and, and selfishness and the hoarding of money, rather than uh, tying that quality to a group who might then be seen as collectively carrying that quality. Surely my mother, young enough to be unconscious of what he was doing, but old enough to be aware of anti-Semitism, had no idea that that part of her love for Benny was an embrace of the relief he provided, making miserliness itself universal and laughable and disarming the generalization, taking on the more interesting, more, more specific exploration of the foolishness of wealth worship, right? Does that, uh, Foster Brooks on the same sort of, uh, he took on the, the ridicule that had been heaped on, 
uh, the Irish and the Native Americans and probably other groups at different times who uh, were said to be prone to alcoholism. And since certain groups have been found to be widely genetically predisposed to the disease of alcoholism, but Brooks made public drunkenness itself into the punchline. He wasn't claiming that it could identify a person as belonging to a group or that it implied that the person came from a group. He was just a drunk. Now, that sort of deep dive examination of the nature of humor has rarely led me to any clear codifiable constant in the process of writing, performing, developing comedy material. I started trying in college, I read Freud's wit and its relation to the unconscious and jokes, uh, the, like the collections of jokes and books by uh, Maury Amsterdam had them and Steve Allen had them and I read all the Woody Allen stuff before that reeked of creepiness. Um, oh, only, the only, uh, I'm sorry, this is, this has no place in this session, but it's the, it's the only impression I do uh, and it is of two people. My, uh, my Woody Allen impression is exactly the same as my Henry Winkler impression, except with significantly less reverse home mortgage and significantly more alleged pedophilia. I, I just got back from England where I accepted the Lewis Carroll Award for overly avuncular behavior. I, I don't want to say that my date was young, but she, she wore a, a training bra from Victoria's Can You Keep a Secret collection. And for the record, I think Bill Cosby is innocent. If, if he were any more innocent, I would find him very attractive. I apologize to anyone who remains a, a big defending fan of Woody Allen or uh, Bill Cosby. If you are offended by that, uh, okay, carry on with your life, or I guess I guess type about it on Twitter because that's how the world works now. Um, what the hell was I talking? The philosophy class. I um I call I wrote a paper. Uh, that I, I called the philosophy of comedy, but it was really just uh, sort of a, a vague unified feels theory and it never really got to a point or figured anything out and it got an A, but that was not my fault. That was entirely on the perfect. I'm, I'm saying uh, it was a bullshit paper. I hadn't figured anything interesting out and it was not one that should have gone on the refrigerator door. Um, at that time, I had just started doing uh, comedy clubs at New York, and I felt sure that there was something in the nature of joke structure itself that could be diagrammed like a sentence. It could be diagrammed like a sentence. And a, a lot of comics played with the idea after a joke failed. Uh, you understand, I did the setup, uh, and then setup plus punchline. So you waited a moment, I took the beat, and then I plus punchline equals. That's where you would have been laughing, ladies and gentlemen. That's where you would have been laughing. There was a lot of that going on as a save, but I genuinely felt as though there was something there. I took the pursuit seriously and I knew that not any two sentences can be set up in punchline. And recently a bunch of things happened right in a row and they were all connected in just under a week. So I started running a weekly writer's workshop specifically for humorists and joke writers. Uh, and it started me thinking a lot about the nature of jokes and revisiting a lot of old thoughts about my work and how they work. And then I quoted a joke from a, a friend on Twitter. Stephen Colbert had tweeted a joke that said, uh, Matt Gates never took COVID-19 seriously because she was a little too old for him. And I remembered that my friend Paul Lander had, uh, Paul Lander, forgive me, Paul. Uh, I remembered that my friend Paul Lander had already tweeted a similar joke. It seemed to me that I'd be doing Paul a topical joke writer a favor by slipping his joke into Colbert's feed, right? He'd started a thread and I would credit him for his joke and get his name on the radar of people who like Colbert and follow him at Stephen at home. Uh, so I said, nice. The great at Paul underscore Lander said it claimed to be COVID-21 and looked like COVID-15, parens, forgive me, Paul, if I misquote you, close parens. And Paul later corrected me. Uh, his line had been, how long before Matt gets says he came down with COVID-17, 
but it told him it was COVID-19. Um, a person I don't know told me that my misquote of Paul's joke could be hurtful to victims of pedophilia. Uh, in a, because that's how Twitter works. And because I take these things very seriously, I began to analyze the joke in its intent and in its execution. I knew it was not my intent to ridicule victims, but I am also aware there have been times I've gotten things wrong. Once in the early 90s, my father said, you have a joke in your act that I find really offensive. And I said, seriously? And he said, yeah, it's just inherently sexist and it bugs the shit out of me. Um, I, I blinked in a way I suspect he could hear over the phone. Uh, I sort of reeled internally through the Rolodex of my act to find it. I had loose leaf bits of a pro-choice segment I was looking at for a second. And as, as, as I was traipsing through my head, parsing the stuff before I found anything problematic, he said, the waitress in the diner. And, you know, the whole joke, the whole bit, it was, it was really a joke, but it was a bit. There was a, there was a, a tap line and then a punch line. And sometimes it unraveled when he said it. It unraveled in front of me. Um, I was, I was faced with my own standards. I understood immediately how wrong it was and I knew horrifyingly that it had been getting me a huge laugh and sometimes an applause break. The joke had layers of powerful funny and got such a big laugh that I had always thought of it as a plus 12 for sure. Recognizing its target though, I knew it to be a minus 49. Even feeling the guilt for having done the joke hundreds of times to great response, uh, combined with the feeling of shame over having done the joke for so long without noticing that the premise itself was wholly misogynist, all of that could not overwhelm my impulse to justify it, right? It's, uh, it, it's why uh, unconscious racists have so much difficulty uh, disavowing their support for all lives matter, right? Because that would mean unraveling all of this thought construct in their heads that I, well, I wanted to avoid seeing the sexism in the subtext so that I could retain the laugh the way some people hold on to beliefs. Sometimes an applause break. The joke originally was this. I went into a Denny's restaurant outside of Amarillo, Texas after a show. Uh, it's 2 a.m. The manager has gone home for the night. The waitress comes over to my table breastfeeding an infant. What a classy establishment. She says, can I get you all anything? I said, yeah. I'd like to see a children's menu. Now, this joke had a lot of power in it. It is structured perfectly to get the laughs. It is a well-crafted spell. It did its work very, very well. One of my favorite things about it was that if I paused long enough between the waitress's question and my response, somebody in the audience, some man, always a man, would shout out, I'll have what he's having. And then I could top his stock line with my artisanal one. And then over the laugh, so sometimes an applause break, I could lean into the microphone and mutter quietly directly to him over the amplifier. Mine will always be funnier than yours. It turned a competitive heckle moment into a clear comedic performer's victory. It was, it was a lot to give up just because it, it required that I say an abhorrent thing in public 
to unite groups of people in joyous laughter. Sometimes applause. The problem was that the, the target of the joke was a working class woman. The setup subtext that leads to the tap line. What a classy establishment. Almost always got at least a, a third of the room chuckling. Sometimes they started chuckling when she's breastfeeding her infant. If that happens, the tap line gets an actual proper laugh. But it also sets forth an agreement in the room that anything of a lower class than those of us in a nightclub is to be despised and dismissed. And, and this gave me permission among us to ridicule her at her imagined place of work. And a whole audience was ready to come with me, not just the men, the whole audience, because it's not about men versus women, it's about that waitress, that lowly waitress in a Denny's, not one of us with our two drink minimums. And then the punchline, I'd like to see a children's menu turns her very body into an item for my pleasure to be chosen from a list at her place of work. And we're all ready to laugh. <laughs> and if I, want, if I want to break it down into, into the most basic joke forms, I, I used a how classless was she joke in the setup and closed it with the ever functional and now that I think of it utterly classless so I fucked her punchline all of this was bolstered by the tittering discomfort of a prudish American public thinking about women breastfeeding their infants as enlightened as we all feel we are now about such issues I'll bet doodads to wingdings I could still get away with that joke today in most comedy clubs in America when I've told this story before in various contexts, I've oft been approached by men my own age or a little younger or significantly older who want to assure me that it's a perfectly good joke and that it made them laugh. But I know better. And I knew better the moment my father called it out, my immediate comprehension of the joke's critical flaws did not stop him from delivering the entirety of lecture 298 on the insidious nature of casual misogyny and the damaging effect of the fashion and cosmetic industries on the development of human sexuality through epigenetic distortion of the love map. He barely acknowledged my comment that they used to get some of those testing rabbits looking pretty sexy. He snorted when I said that I don't so much have a love map as a weird scavenger hunt. I would explain that to you in detail, but I know that if you don't share my specific fetishes and fantasies, it will just sound skeevy and perverse or frankly fictional. So I cut the waitress joke and eventually replaced it with a joke that took a long time to design. It came in the midst of a story about the world's stupidest money of which I was a victim many years ago. And while I know this to be a better joke than the original, it almost never got more than a chuckle from more than a 10th of a club crowd. The joke it turned into was this. She was fired from her job as a bartender for breastfeeding her infant in the back room on a break. In an establishment, mind you, that proudly displays posters of the Coors Girls because we live in a bizarre society where it's okay to use breasts to sell beer, but not to feed children. The underlying idea is one I am comfortable presenting, but it's not a joke that works to applause breaks in nightclubs. Uh, sometimes with just the right audience, the people who are on the same page with me politically and emotionally and are uh, and are not drunk, uh, sometimes it gets a response, but there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of machinery there. Um, there's a lot of machinery there, but it does heavy lifting in the psyche. 
and you work the leverage right and you can drop a big heavy thought in passing on the way to a larger point. So it it's a better joke with a smaller audience response in comedy clubs. And there are comics who will disagree with me and will tell me that there is no such thing as a better joke that gets a smaller laugh. And I would just say that is not true. Now I use the elements of the joke that I had originally written and served as its engine. We all think of women's breasts as a little bit naughty to talk about in public. There have been arguments over where and when women should breastfeed their infants by changing the target of the joke from the woman to the objectification of women. I built something subtler and more nuanced and more powerful. My point is, when I'm told a joke is offensive, I do my homework. I think it through. I struggled with this online critic's objection. I carefully deconstructed the joke, both as I had misquoted it and as it had been originally written. I decided whether to delete the offending tweet as a, as a process. I, I, even, even as I started to work through the, the decision, I replied, I am very sorry I offended you. That was not my intent. And before I had figured out my thoughts on the offending joke, the person replied that they were not offended. They thought people who had been victims might be. And I was faced with the basic decency of someone leaping to somebody else's defense the way my father had to the defense of this imaginary waitress in this 2 a.m. Denny's. I, um, I suggested that the joke was at the expense of Matt Gates, and they, they said that the punchline was literally the victims. 15, they typed. 15, without the pedophilia, there's no joke. And within the same span of time that this was going on, uh, and this was you know, a three or four day exchange over Twitter. Uh, my wife bought me a, 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 a clipper. Uh, uh, it's designed for people who manscape. It's, a, it's a for, uh, for men, it's a clipper for men who scape. Is that, it's a, is, and it wasn't a hint, that would be weird and rude. Uh, she knows that I am uh, here suit to such an extent that when I am naked, I seem to wear a hair suit. Um, <laughs> I have a gag that I do alone in the mirror coming out of the shower where uh, I drop my body weight and I let my gut stick out and I say wearing a gorilla costume and then I suck up intense I'm not wearing a gorilla costume wearing a gorilla costume not wearing a gorilla costume wearing a gorilla costume not wearing a gorilla costume. And I can I can get a laugh out of myself with this three, five times, seven times, usually an odd number. And uh, one afternoon, she uh, sort of caught me doing this and watched before I noticed. And then she said, honey, just two different gorilla costumes. Um, so she, she knows that I have a level of self-consciousness and self-aware. Robin Williams once accused me of being hairier than thou. Um, I, I used the uh, electric shaver and I did it so that I, I've been wearing a full button up and tie uh, every time I have to be on the Zoom for anything because nobody wants to see me in medium close up uh, on a, on a, in a conversation in a polo shirt with unruly Yeti fur escaping the collar. It's just, it's not. So uh, I started uh, shaving to make myself presentable and I wrote the joke, uh, I don't shave my shoulders out of vanity, I do it so that my shirts will fit. And then uh, I used it as a throwaway line on a, in a Zoom panel thing. And then, uh, uh, and then we sort of reached the end of the pandemic and I was, I, I, I'm half vaxxed and I'm, I still wear the mask. I mean, even after I'm fully vaccinated, I'm going to keep wearing the mask out of an abundance of vanity. But I, I you know, I, I, go, I finally felt comfortable taking my, my housebound dog out to the dog park. And a guy at the park approached me and said, hey, I saw your, your uh, panel thing on Zoom you did. And I have to tell you something about one of your jokes because that's how the dog park works, apparently. Uh, no, because that's how my, that's how my, uh, work works. 
not a lot of people have heard of me, but once they see or hear or read my work, they seem to find me relatable and uh, uh, valuable and want very much to help me get better. Uh, and because I have been involved in this career of mine over its entire course, I have thousands of stories about people who have wanted to help me in this way. As this man in, at the dog park said it, I remembered a guy at a club in Texas in the mid eighties before my father had called me out on the waitress joke, maybe before I'd written it. I was a feature act doing left-leaning machine gun jokes on politics, updating bits every day so that each bit started from the most recent current event and worked its way backward through the longer running news story and grabbed in the big ideas from there. So it always looked as though Everything was off the top of my head. It was the very start of my understanding of the value uh, I ascribe to a, a well-structured set, a tight bit, a, a, a chunk that fits together elegantly, and the power of comedy to let me say aloud the things that I dare not say at a party, and to be celebrated, not bludgeoned. The, the headliner that weekend in Texas could not understand why his bulletproof gaze in the military routine wasn't working. Can you imagine what they'll do with the barracks, darling? It'll be fabulous. It was playing rough on the ears of a crowd that had just been applauding my simple observation turned leading question. If you're in a foxhole under heavy fire, don't you think the guy next to you is more likely to save your life if he's in love with you? A local audience, the singular, capable at best of providing an applause, approached me after a show and said, hey, you know what you could say up there? I better get a good laugh. And I was young. I had not yet learned how bad an idea it can be to engage that conversation. And also, it's polite. And clearly, he felt generally connected to me in some way and felt he could be helped. So I said, what have you got? He drawled. You could say, like, do it as a riddle. You could say like, what do you call a nuclear bomb going off at a RNC convention? And I searched my mind for a clever double meaning that might give me a clue as to where this was going. I couldn't find an anagram or an acronym. If I can't find the answer fast, I am happy to be the straight man. So I said, I don't know, Smedley, what do you call a nuclear bomb going off at a RNC convention? And he said, a good start. Then he hung his mouth open like Fozzie Bear waiting for his appreciative laugh. And I said, yeah, I can't use that. He said, oh, sure, we do versions of it all the time. 11 tax men dying of cancer, a busload of whatever going off a cliff, always works. And I made that one up. You know, you can use that because you're a liberal, right? So you want to go after the Republicans when you're doing your skit. I nodded, I suspect. I remember thinking, I can't do that joke because I'm not a sociopath. I'm not a genocidal sociopath. I can't do that joke because the implication is that I would prefer people I disagree with politically were dead and the subtext is that we all agree with that notion. I did not say that. I remember also, if I am being honest in my telling, that I feared that it wouldn't take much for me to find out just how much anti-Semitism still roils under the surface in Texas. And this whole memory suddenly leapt up before me as I'm standing in the park with this man who had just offered me something that he felt about one of the jokes I'd done on a Zoom panel. Now I know how bad an idea it is to engage this conversation. But also this is someone who took time to look at something I had done online and felt somehow connected to me and who apparently wanted to help. I said, what do you got? He said, it's just, look, I don't think you should do that joke about shaving your back so your shirts will fit. I blinked in a way that I rarely do when I am not speaking to my father. I was trying to suss out how this joke could possibly bother him. So I said, okay, Smedley, why shouldn't I do the joke about shaving my back so as my shirts will fit? And he said, because you're not Armenian. 
And I could, I could hear the way the joke would play out. I could hear the laughter of the imaginary crowd if I changed his tone just a little bit to be angry perhaps and not abstractly defensive. But this man was clearly blonde, clearly Nordic. And I felt like I was caught in a scene from a play I had not agreed to do. I suspect I have heard the relatively benign stereotype that has Armenians uh, and sometimes Russians and sometimes Scots as being overly hairy. And I know stereotypes and I know the jokes based on them well enough that even if I hadn't heard those before, uh, I would in the time it took him to say it, in the time it took me to think about it, reverse engineered why this joke worked and I would see the machinery and I knew that he had just handed me a punchline I would never use. And I remembered my sexist joke and I remembered the guy at the bar in the Texas and I remembered Jack Benny and I understood at last, God, this last month, I understood at last a fundamental principle of the verbal joke. A joke has a setup and a punchline. It seems as though it's a simple equation of addition that sums up to laughter. But in between, there's uh, this thing that I call the Masonic capstone of the joke, or as I hope someday somebody will call it, Brody's Masonic capstone. The Masons who worked with stone figured out how to shape a block to go at the top of an archway so as to dis distribute weight both downward and outward along uh, 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 different planes so that they could, they could create archways that were taller than framed doors. They used intersecting arches to create vast vaulted cathedrals with internal acoustics that changed voice to tone and echoed in ways that allowed an early kind of overdubbing for those who properly learned the power of reverberation and echo. The Masons learned to defy gravity, to create impossible structure, to contain and expand sound, and they knew that this magic had power. So like the Druids with the great leaf-strung libraries hidden in the pre-Christian forests before the War of the Trees and their silent transmissions through hand weavings that let them read one another's minds across vast distances, they kept their secret and so mystery and mystique grew up around them. The Masonic capstone of the joke is that bit of the joke that the listener or the reader must supply after the punchline, retroactively rewriting a thought pattern followed from the setup. Sometimes that capstone is a quality in the teller. Sometimes that capstone comes in the form of the realization that the wrong assumption has been made as to which meaning of a word was intended or the recognition of a, a misleading sound alike. When the capstone of the joke is a shared assumption that all of a particular group have a particular quality, or that we all feel the same way about a particular group. Stereotyping has replaced authentic observation and a minus 42 or below is born. The capstone of the joke nestled invisibly between the setup and punchline reveals when parsed out the target of the joke what or who the joke ridicules, skewers, wounds, and the vehicle of the joke. What shared bit of understanding, knowledge, or assumption has allowed the listener or reader or Twitter follower to step backward a moment, to return to that bridge of thought between setup and punchline. We must return to the moment at which our mind misguessed to reroute the synapses to complete the tiny arc of an idea. The moment of understanding something is delightful. 
This is why children laugh. They are understanding new things all the time. If the capstone of a joke is an unspoken assumption that we all agree that a particular group of people should die, you can bet the target of the joke is not a particular quality of some people. It is the people themselves. If the vehicle of a joke is an assumption of a particular quality and a, an attachment of that quality to a group of people, the target, as a means of disparaging them, you've stumbled into stereotypes. When we begin to dissect jokes, the way we diagram sentences, we realize that setup plus punchline only covers the visible aspects of the joke, the Masonic capstone, the magic bit, the bit that determines the target of the joke, once the vehicle has been properly identified, holds up the weight of the joke, surprising and delightful and impossible. In this hidden part comes the real idea we impress subliminally upon the minds of our audience. And I raced home from the dog park knowing how to do the work to figure it out like I was breaking down a complex sentence, seeking the tenor in the vehicle of a, of a, of a complicated simile. I, I broke open the Twitter contested joke my friend had written, and I broke open my own joke, and the setup was Mac gets his relationship to COVID-19, and the punchline was that the virus had a number too high for his taste, and the Masonic capstone of the joke was the shared knowledge that we're all pretty sure Mad Gates has been paying for sex with little girls, or as the white male dominated press likes to say, underage women. Let me interrupt this uh, hermeneutic discourse on the deconstruction of humor to say this parenthetically. There are no underage women. There are girls. Girls cannot be fucked. That's not me by being judgmental or making a behavioral suggestion. This is linguistic fact. A girl can only be raped. The only reason to call a girl an underage woman is to mitigate guilt over the raping of a girl or, you know, generations of girls at a rate of between one out of three and one out of seven, depending on where you get your information. And similarly, when the news media uses the expression young man to be tried as an adult, that is a euphemism for a black child who has committed any offense. White boys who commit the same offenses require no such euphemism because they don't go to court under the infuriating but still popular boys will be boys defense. Also, sometimes their fathers for whom they grew up campaigning may have sat them down for lecture number 318 on how you work the system by talking to your buddies so that that whole thing just goes away. And this brings us back to the Matt Gates joke. And by the Matt Gates joke, I don't mean... Uh, his face or his political career. I mean, the one I misquoted. Uh, the target of the joke is Matt Gates. The vehicle of attack in this case with which the punch is delivered comes when the listener, reader, or Twitter follower realizes that the joke isn't about Matt Gates and COVID. It's about this alleged aspect of his personality, the character flaw of trafficking in children for the purpose of sexual exploitation. I am wholly comfortable in my disdain for child molestation in general. While it may be a little bit controversial or challenging that anyone discuss the topic at all, I'm willing to find the humor in anything. As long as I'm not perpetuating a damaging sociological norm. It terrifies me that someone, anyone would be offended by the edgy stance that systematized child prostitution is bad probably the one place QAnon followers and I can find common ground. Moreover, I am comfortable with my choice to use the edgy feel of the joke and the currently on our minds fuel to take pot shots at radical conservative, science denying, insurrectionist agitator, second generation faux populist politician, wearer of pandemic mocking gas mask, sharer of nude photos on the floor of the house, frat boy and state representative duly elected by some of Florida, Matt Gates. I could leave the tweet in the thread without guilt. And I kept trying to improvise through all these ideas that were floating around in my head, but it wasn't coming together. It felt as though I was onto something interesting. And I suppose you will be the judge of that. And all of these events coming so close together spun my mind into action with the, the promise of some profound meaning, because clearly 
there seem to be guideposts flying by me, helping me discover and reveal an underlying structure of humor, the element that gives it potency, the follow signs were everywhere. And the craft of comedy lies in the setups and the punchlines and the art comes in the capstones and choosing them wisely and creating the necessary scaffolding to make certain that the targets of our spells are chosen by us, not just made convenient by the zeitgeist. I cannot see the world through the entertainment industry's reductive lens, seeking that which can be seen at once by all, comforting and welcomed and profitable. We wield powerful ancient magics and I strive to do so nobly. I seek not the lowest denominator, but the highest resonance. And then Mike Kaplan emailed me something that he had found online and that made him think of a conversation he and I once had about the magical nature of jokes. When it came across my desk, I saw my mistake immediately. These were not thoughts to be improvised through loosely to shape on the fly. I had been devaluing the power that I have, not banking the effort to make it look effortless. I had to dig into my skills set, stringing thoughts and stories into narratives that illuminate something greater than I can ever put into a single clear sentence or a crystalline joke shining and multifaceted. I needed a, I needed to stop abrogating my responsibility as a creator, a writer, a thinker, an artist, and a coach. They weren't just some ideas. These were ideas that presented themselves on a path littered with signs. These ideas needed respect and craftsmanship. They needed care and tending and focus and lensing. So I sat with them and turned them into this introduction to the writing that Mike sent me. Alan Moore's thoughts on magic and art. It came to my attention at precisely the correct moment. And it is with this that I will begin today's session. I will, if you've been, I see some of you have, if you have been listening to your breath, I'll talk you back into the room at three, two, one. Please open your eyes and listen to the following with which I open today's session from Alan Moore. I believe that magic is art and that art, whether it be writing, music, sculpture, or any form is literally magic. Art is like magic, the science of manipulating symbols, words, or images to achieve changes in consciousness. Originally, all the facets of our culture, whether they be in the arts or sciences, were the province of the shaman. The fact that in present times, this magical power has degenerated to the level of cheap entertainment and manipulation is, I think, a tragedy. At the moment, the people who are using shamanism and magic to shape our culture are advertisers. Rather than try to wake people up, their shamanism is used as an opiate to tranquilize people, to make people more manipulable. Their magic box television and their magic words and their jingles can cause everyone in the country to be thinking the same words and have the same banal thoughts all at exactly the same moment. Artists and writers have allowed themselves to be sold down the river. They have accepted the prevailing belief that art and writing are merely forms of entertainment. They're not seen as transformative forces that can change a human being, that can change a society. They are seen as simple entertainment. Things with which we can fill 20 minutes, half an hour while we're waiting to die. It's not the job of the artist to give the audience what the audience wants. If the audience knew what they needed, they wouldn't be the audience, they would be the artists. It is the job of the artists to give the audience what they need. 
Now I'm going to move us straight into a writing drill and then we'll take a later break today and uh, 